It's an absolute thrill to be back. I feel like I've been on my way here for a long time. Um, been thinking into and praying into and absolutely falling in love with the theme that your leaders have chosen, this theme, worthy. This very idea that there is something so intentional over our lives that somewhere we can have the audacious idea that we are indeed worthy. But we need to find out what that really looks like, and that's the purpose of my being here with you tonight. I don't want to su suggest that there aren't grand women who've never known Jesus, may never hear his name, who aren't doing remarkable things. It's not as if you have to be a Christian to be a woman of great worth. But tonight we are here intentionally as people who love the Lord or people who are interested in finding out about him. So we're keeping the context of this idea of worthy as settled in the idea that God has a plan for our life, as you heard at the start when that beautiful um, pottery scene, that was just very, very lovely. I did pottery um, at um, Teachers College. I can't remember why. Not sure I made anything memorable. Because if I had, I would have remembered it. It's just such a flow of logic there. <laughs> Sometimes I enjoy hearing what I have to say. All right. <laughs> One of the reasons I love being in events like this and gatherings like this is because there's an ambient atmosphere that says, let's run together. There's a sense of oneness, and I think that's a fantastic thing. This conference, when it began, began with that idea of oneness, togetherness. And so right now, I do want to quickly tell you a little story to give honour to that conference in 2011, because if I don't tell you, you won't know. At that conference, Christy very graciously invited me to be here as the speaker. And she had somebody else come who I think I had met but had no sense of connection with. And her name was Ruth O'Hanlon. And she stood here and promoted a conference called Arise that was being held in Istanbul. And it was for Central Asian women. I don't know if you can remember that. But she promoted it, and you as a church sewed into that, which is why I want to tell you what's been going on. At the end of this conference, this sister's conference, Ruth said to me, would you mind if I gave your details to the convener of the conference, a WEC missionary who lives in UK, um, to see if you'd like to be a speaker at that conference? Well, what she didn't know was that when I was doing some work in Ukraine, at one, on one of those trips, I took a lot of pastors and leaders into Ukraine over quite a period of time, and we were in the airport, and you're at the airport, you're not really in what you'd call a spiritual zone. You just want to get through. And one of them stopped me. She said, God's just spoken to me, and you've got another country in your heart. Well, really? Um, so you go, well, of course. Um, you know, anything, anything, anything up there. And I heard <laughs> in here, and I heard, don't want to let it down, I'm the leader. Um, and I heard myself say, oh, I do, Turkey. And then I went, <laughs> but you know, picked up my bags and kept walking. Anyway, now, all these years later, that was in 2004. This is now 2011, and I still hadn't connected the dots. Well, I went home, and I didn't hear anything, and I thought, well, I mustn't have cut, been good enough, you know, made the cut. And then, can you believe, on Anzac Day, an English person, they don't know about Anzac Day. On a, this, this is just the glorious generosity of God. On Anzac Day, I get an email from this woman, will you come and speak at our conference in Istanbul, which I did. And then she said, would you come back? And I said, I would. And then she said, would you come back? And I said, I would. Next year, I'll be back for the fifth time. I am having a blast at this conference, Central Asian Women. Their stories are incomprehensible. Stories of husbands who gamble them. Stories of women escaping by the skin of their teeth 
and being led by angels to a place of refuge. I've never heard anything like it. It's the most redemptive thing I've ever had anything to do with. So I want to encourage those of you who were there in 2011. Something got seeded in this environment and it's proving to be a tremendous blessing in my life and I pray in the lives of these women a great deal of development has happened within that conference and it's had to move Istanbul. It's not the smartest place to gather as a whole lot of Christian women. Um, anymore. Um, But I have bought a ring there. There's always a blessing. Um, (laughs) You've got to keep (laughs) big picture thinking. Um, (laughs) It's not how it was meant to start. (laughs) Our worth. That's right. Worthy. Have we got the title back? Loved into worth, that's the title of the message. These guys know what they're doing after all. Loved into worth. That's where I want to start tonight because if we don't get this right, we won't get anything else right. If we don't understand the plan of God, which was for a love relationship with us, we won't get anything else right. So this is where we have to start. Uh, Years ago, I can remember hearing an amazing Um, uh, she was a little Baptist missionary and I say little because she was about this tall and she'd worked in India for many years and had a touch of God, the fire of God on her and I would have been about 24 and uh, in New Zealand, in New Plymouth and I remember hearing her say and I would love to mimic her because it was an inimitable sound but I won't because you don't know her and I just sound rude but it was an inimitable sound and she said, God blesses the messer and unmesses his mess. Isn't that wonderful? I've never forgotten it. I thought that is exactly what he does. I can't express to you, I don't have enough words to express to you this extraordinary capacity that God has to pick us up and to make us and remake us, to break us and remake us, to form and mould us into his original intention for what we were going to be like. I wish I could use graphic language to explain to you how exquisite his, it, it, his attention is to every one of you, to me, when he says, I've got a plan for that life. I declare that life worthy. It doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter what other people say. I declare that life worthy. It's not a lot of use for us to try and figure that out on our own, uh, which is why I had that second little story up on the screen. I adore this, and it might mean something to you too. Let's have a look at it together. So this is a 14th century mystic, Muhammad Hafiz. Some of you who are doing um, some studies may come across his materials now. They're getting a little bit of an unearthing. He's the one that said, the message of God comes to earth as four words. Come dance with me. Isn't that brilliant? But there was also this I found, and I think it's outstanding. What is the difference? So he's he's writing this to a really uptight religious lady. What is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God. And the beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Whereas, my dear, I'm afraid you think you still have a thousand serious moves. You know, in my life, I haven't made anything like a thousand serious moves, but the few I have made have been a complete mess. And I've needed that God who blesses the messer and unmesses his mess. I've needed a God who knows how to take my breath away with his unfailing love. A God who looks down at my efforts and says, if you'll allow me to trip over you with joy, if you'll allow me to surprise you with my love, together we're going to make a story that won't fail. Now, I'm going to get to that in a moment because I've discovered something in the last few weeks that's absolutely doing my head in. It is so good. But I've got to take 40 minutes, so I need to do some other stuff first. (laughs) When I was about 20, 21, 
in New Zealand, and I'd made some, some of my few mess-up moves um, to try and, you know, put life together, I found that I was crying a lot. If we worship the Lord, I'd cry. If somebody looked at me kindly, I'd cry. If I said to God, I love you, I'd cry. If I felt his love, I cried. And I thought I was kind of cracking up a little bit. This went on and on and on. And I said to a wise lady one day, I was telling her what was going on. I cry, it doesn't take much. And I'm, you know, bawling my eyes out. And I'm feeling a bit like I'm drawing attention to myself because I'm not a quiet crier. Are Baptist women quiet criers? Uniting church women are. I've been to things with them and they're just... (laughs) So, you know, it was was getting a bit, um, I'd like to have brought it under control sooner. And and she said something that, um, that helped me understand it. She said, he's melting your heart. Isn't that lovely? He's melting your heart. God's love for me in all its tributaries since that time has been for me an assumption, not a question. Here is the miracle. Since that time, and it's of four and a half decades, over 45 years, since that time, I have never doubted God's love for me. But here's the kicker. I've never doubted his enjoyment of my love for him. My love for him is selfish, it's chaotic, it's spasmodic sometimes, it's words but not a lot of actions. It's a bit of a shambles of a love, this love that we people can offer the God above all gods and the Lord above all lords. But he goes, I'll take it. Thank you. I pray that when you walk away from here tomorrow afternoon, you too will have had your heart melted that you'll never again doubt the love of God for you, but you'll never again question how he's hanging out to receive your love of him. Don't ever think it's got to be some sort of polished, polished up version of some perfection love. We won't get there. Let's not waste our time. Let's just offer him what we have and see him Enjoy it greatly. Let's ground his love in the word. And I've taken us to 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 to 19. Now, if you've never been to a conference like this before and you're not too sure about how the Christian walk hangs together, we use the word of God as our guide for life. And we try not to believe anything that's not in it. We're pretty good at inventing bits um, that suit at times, um, and they are interesting uh, churches to belong to. But this is a good one, and um, they just believe what the word says. So out of everywhere I could have gone about anything to do with love, I've gone to this book in the Bible, 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 and 9 to 19. So I'm going to read it slowly, and you can see it up on the screen. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, which I hope by the time we all leave here tonight will be a full house. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Not a lot of women can say that, can they? That the man you're married to, the parents you had, the friends you have, you can trust their love? It's not an assumption, is it? But I would say that right there, we have the greatest antidote to any feelings of unworthiness. If you're feeling unworthy, there's your answer. Put your trust in God's great love. And he continues to write, God is love. And all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. You're seeing a pattern here. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we'll not be afraid in the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. 
Now, you could, I could read that over and over several times tonight before we'd really even understand it. But I want to suggest to you that that's a rich munch. Don't you feel? All who live in God. We live in love. We live in God. God lives in us. There are some big statements there. Be satisfied at this point that his perfect love loves us into worth. And if we don't accept that, and it's just a little cute cartoon here, we end up being like the girl who's just, he loves me, he loves me a lot, he loves me, he loves me not. And in case you can't see it, on the final little frame, it's, hey, this flower's missing a petal. <laughs> in other words, we don't want it to end up with he loves me not. When it comes to God, we can't end up with he loves me not. Now, here's the thing. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, you see a beautiful cross when you walk into this building. He died on the cross because of an incredibly powerful emotion in God's heart, which was love. He died on the cross, and in that act, he reversed the curse that came upon women at the start of time. If we want to find our worth, we find it in that amazing act of love, of Jesus dying on the cross. Now, Barb very graciously asked me about titles that would work for the conference, and I said, look, I've got a book that my father wrote. I published it posthumously. He was a highly intelligent man, was the principal of the Assemblies of God Bible Colleges in New Zealand and Australia. So I'm doing it now. It's not a promo. Well, it is a promo. I don't want to go home with any. Um, but I've got 24. <laughs> I just brought 24 of these books called The Cross and Salvation. It is like a one-stop shop. If you want to know what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, and you're not sure what that looks like theologically, get the book. <coughs> I think you'll find that it is a great blessing to you. We need to understand that cross is our legal currency. For daring to say anything, let alone something as preposterous as, oh, I am a woman of worth. If we want to have a hope of seeing ourselves as God sees us, our most valid and true worth, it helps to come to grips with his unrelenting love. Our human love can be glorious, can be wonderful, it can be disappointing, it can be exposing, it can be testing, rewarding, selfish, selfless, all at the same time. But the Father's love is unadulterated by human limitations. If we put ourselves in a court of law in our own head and we declare that we are unworthy of God's love, I've got some good news for you. You'll lose. His love is unrelenting. You can't put yourself in any situation where a debate with God is going to see you come off best. His love is going to chase you down. It will beat you down until, as Hafiz says, we finally say, I'm tripping over with joy. I understand what you have done for me. Tonight, I don't plan to go into the theology of love. To explain the love of the Father for us is actually a little difficult to do at the best of times, but it's not my purpose tonight, nor do I plan to go into any discussion about the varieties of love. I think that's a different message, but rather I just want to kind of mosey around the general idea of it. So here's a question. Is our worth set by our righteousness or by the righteousness of Christ in us? That's my question. Is our sense of worth set by our righteousness or by the righteousness of Christ in us? Now, I suspect that any good Baptist knows that, of course, the answer is that it's by his righteousness in us. We would have that as an understanding. We chop that out very quickly. But I think every good Baptist woman's not unlike every other Christian woman I've ever met, which is we run the risk that we too easily set about being good in order to please him, and sooner or later we find ourselves kind of merging with an idea of our worth being established by our behaviours. 
We turn up when we're having a good week. We're not so sure that we should turn up when things aren't going so well. Let me take a few minutes to paint this picture. It's not, pre- not pretty, so I'm not going to take too long. Um, but anxiety about this whole thing of love and worth, I think is a ball and chain around the ankles of many good women and Christian women. Let me read you some of the questions that build this anxiety in us. Am I loving enough? Because of the challenges that I'm having with him or with her or it, does confessing that I love God make me a fraud? If I love that person or thing, Am I somehow betraying the purity of my faith? Is loving that person or thing going going to enhance my walk with God or damage it? Is it even okay to love that person or thing? And where does loving myself cross the line and become more about entitlement? There's a lot of anxiety caught up in all of that. Don't you think? Proverbs 12, verse 25 says, An anxious heart weighs a man down. That sort of thinking is crazy making, which is why we have to fully understand that our worth is only in Him. Anxiety will mess with our friendships, it'll mess with our sense of worth, it'll mess with our joy levels. I've got a little picture here and um, it's, I, I'm just, okay, here we go. <laughs> now, they're my friends. They're my friends. The one on the left, Dot, is praying for you right now. She is now actually the team leader of the intercessory prayer team for Arise, all because of this conference. They've been my friends for 40 years and I don't have to be a certain kind of righteous for that friendship to hold steady for that long. But I've got it up there because uh, the one on the left, the one on the right, no, they're gone. The one on the right was my matron of honour. The one on the left, she and I sit in church together and um, we don't ring each other up to find out what we're wearing, but we do ring each other up to find out which service we're going to so we can sit together. So when I'm there, um, so one Sunday, a couple of, I think maybe two years ago, I was sitting in my seat and Dot came and sat there and then a young woman, I saw her coming out of the corner of my eye and she sat next to Dot and she clearly hadn't seen me. So she and Dot are talking and, yeah, hi, my name is Dot, what's your name? My name's Nicole, la, la. And I leant forward and I said, oh, hi, Nicole. And she said, oh, do you two know each other? I said, oh, yes, we've been friends for 40 years. And her jaw dropped. She said, how did you do that? And I've never been asked that question before. Um, And I heard myself provide the answer. I said, because it's a friendship without anxiety. I've never had to worry about whether they like me or not. They've just got me whether they want to or not. (laughs) We don't have to find out if we're all okay with each other. We've just done life together, some highs and some lows for sure. So if anxiety about all kinds of things doesn't help us in this journey of love, in this journey of establishing our worth, in this journey of knowing what it is to live in God and God live in us, if anxiety isn't going to help, is there anything that does? Of course there is. I want to put to you that when we base our sense of worth on our goodness, or in our sense of being right, our rightness or our righteousness, sooner or later, we will run out of puff. We just can't keep that thing going. Our sense of worth must be established by the truth that his righteousness lives in us. God's unquenchable hunger for relationship with us, his forever love has given us a way of living that is way past being anxiety ridden and a torturous mode of he loves me, he loves me not, I hope the right number of petals are on the flower. So here's how it works. Now this is, this is hot. You are the first people who've ever heard this from me. This is just like two weeks ago. It was like bing and my head's been pounding ever since with excitement and I can't wait to see how this goes. <coughs> 
Here we go. I want you to understand righteousness. So first of all, let me just pop this screen up and then we'll pop it into the Word of God. Our righteousness, our sense of worth, our sense of worthiness, it relies on perfection and disciplines. If I'm good enough and if I can just stay being good enough, if you can look at me and find no fault in me, if you can realise that I'm one of the proper Christians, and I'll get there, by the way, with very good disciplines, then surely I will have been proven to be a woman of great worth. Now, you can hear by my tone of voice and my face and everything that it's a load of rubbish. But we get there. We, that's what we do. His righteousness, because we have now, as Hafiz says, we've just stopped trying to impress him. His righteousness at work in us, instead of it being about our perfections and our disciplines, it just produces in us a holiness, holy God. I love the old word piety, which is why I've used it. I think it's beautiful. Not horrible, pious, just the idea of piety, of humility before God, of owning his lordship, of recognising his greatness, and with that devotion. I've never been more in love with the Lord than I am now, and never more quick to recognise my frailty. On any given day, I'm just one bad decision away from being a complete train wreck. And I don't say that in order to put myself down. It's the human condition. But when we understand his righteousness in us, which I hope I'm about to explain well, it leaves us absolutely like this, with a smile on our face responding to the twinkle in his eye. So, let's have a look at scripture. I've found you a scripture that you may have heard of before. It's sometimes used in communion. It's a phrase that has been around, uh, and it's this. Um, we, so I'll read the whole thing. We are all as an unclean thing, and here's the phrase, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's the King James, one of the earliest translations of the Bible, which is why the language is so as it is. The, that little phrase, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Now, what you need to know is that when Isaiah was writing that, what has been translated as filthy rags, and in most of the translations, it's not too dissimilar to that. It's actually the cloth, the menstrual cloth. This is the rag or the cloth that is worn that releases a menstrual flow, the menstrual flux if, um, is what is used in the translating, uh, in the understandings of that. So we know, we know what that is. Let me, let me just back up and say, if you've never heard this phrase before and you've grown up as I have in the church, when you've heard it, it's been accompanied with a kind of a screwed up nose and like, oh my goodness me, our righteousness. You know, and, and, and it's often been a man up there. No, he wouldn't have done that. But, you know, the atmosphere was there, you know, oh, the menstrual cloth and oh, the smell. Um, and it's been dramatic. And it used to kind of annoy me because I'm going... God made me to function like that. Don't make me ashamed of this thing. So it's kind of with that thought that I'm now putting it to you. All our righteousness, it's not so much that our righteousness are, you know, it's that our righteousness has the sense of a, a loss of something not fertilised. Our righteousness, the evidence of our best effort is Nothing got fertilised here. There's no life flowing here. Now, I want to quickly stop and apologise and repent to any of you for whom that is a heartache situation. I'm now a grandmother, one of the world's oldest first-time grandmothers, but I have a five... Today, he's five weeks old. Last night, I dreamt that he was walking at six months. There's no <laughs> pressure on that kid. But for five and a half years, my daughter-in-law had the evidence. 
and it's a heartache, it's a heartbreak. And I ask those of you who are suffering for any reason to just cover me with a little grace while I try to explain this teaching to you. Our righteousness has had nothing in it that suggests reproductivity or capacity or capability for anything reproductive. Our righteousness... Now, look, this isn't to say don't do nice things. Not at all. I'm trying to establish true biblical worth. And that comes out of his righteousness in us, not our perfections and disciplines, not our sense of, gee, you know, I hope they choose me for the worship team because I'm really powering on in God. So we work hard for him. And we do, but we're not bringing him into the story. We're working hard for him, but we're not understanding his unrelenting love. We're working hard for him, but we're not recognizing that even if we weren't working hard, he's still got a twinkle in his eye and he still loves us to bits. And so someday it looks like, well, that didn't work. I did it, I did it the best I knew how, but the evidence is that life still isn't flowing. What's to be done about that? Praise God, Jesus died on the cross. Praise God, we are on this side of the cross. And we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. Now, it's not the purpose of this message to talk into you know, well, I've become a Christian, I'm still sinning, and it says here we're not to sin, and he can't go on sinning. I'm not. Nah. Um, can I, do you mind if I just leave that and go and talk to somebody else about that later? Because there's, you know, good understanding of what that's all about. I just want to hit that middle phrase God's seed remains in him. Now, that word seed, the Greek word for that is sperma. Well, I don't have to interpret that for you. So, what it means is this is what it looks like. Here we are, and we give our hearts to Jesus Christ, and now the core of who we are, his divine intention for the reason we're here on the planet, is now invaded by something we'll never get if we don't invite him in, which is his seed comes in, and now his seed comes into my potential, and all of a sudden there's not going to be a monthly release that is evidence of an unproductive, unfruitful life. Now I'm living by his righteousness. He has seeded himself into my being. Does this mean I'm not going to make mistakes? Of course it doesn't. I've already explained that to you. This is not about us now living a perfectionist life. This is about us standing tall and turning up no matter what crazy thing we've done, no matter how daft our world is. We don't turn up and go, well, I'm here because I am, you know, Mrs. Christian 2017. It's now I'm turning up because I'm just an idiot who loves God and he loves me and I've got his righteousness in me because his seed remains in me and everything I do now just doesn't doesn't turn to something that lands on a rag and says nothing happening here. Thank you. <laughs> In my head, I'm going, I'll do that better next time I preach it. <laughs> our belief about our worth is not contingent upon the number of good things we've just done. Our belief about our worth is contingent only on the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sin and when we invite him in, his seed remains in us and now we are born of the spirit and life flows. Our sense of worth must never be tethered to our levels of perfection or imperfection, to our disciplines or our lack of them. Our sense of worth is only ever to be tethered to God's unrelenting love for us. That excites me hugely. And it explains why sometimes 
when we would have dismissed us from the plan, God uses us anyway. It explains why sometimes we think, well, I've done this and this and this. I thought other things would have started to cook by now. And they haven't quite. It's because he's wanting us yet to learn the lesson that as he indwells us, so we carry something divine. Something divine. I could stand here and give you so many stories of times where God has blessed me in spite of, not because of. If you've got a because of mentality, I ask you tonight to lay it down. You don't want to have the flow that says evidence, nothing's really living here. His love, loved into worth. There's a beautiful hymn. As I was preparing for this, I kept remembering it. I think, I don't know where I've ever heard it. It's certainly old and the language of it is old. What I'm asking you to do, if you would, is just close your eyes. And I'm going to say it very, very slowly because... Um, it's unusual language, and I want you to get it. And then we're going to see what God does. Just maybe close your eyes so you can focus on the beauty of this ancient hymn. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give you back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, joy that seeks me through the pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not in vain that morn shall tearless be. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. In ocean steps of his love, our lives, our worth, may richer, fuller be. We can love that God. We can trust that God. We can trust that his love for us is not conditional upon what we have regarded as our reasons to be recognised by him. We can trust that his love for us overrides our cleverness and our catastrophes. It overrides our spiffiness and our sorrows. It overrides all of the meritorious things that we do and also the messes that we make. His love doesn't come and go. It's not conditional. And every woman sitting here who well knows the cold hand of conditional love, can I tell you tonight that you can, if you haven't already done so, have a relationship that is beautifully described by one of the old Bible writers as a relationship where you never see his shadow of turning. Just stick with me a bit and then we're going to sing a song and I'll tell you what we're going to do. But if you have 
if you are in a situation where it feels to you that too often you're watching somebody's back as they walk away, I want to introduce you to Jesus because he's never going to take his eyes off you. You can come and go. You can turn and swivel and twist. But every time you turn around and look at him, you'll find he's not shifted his gaze off you. That's an awesome love. If you have never given your heart to Jesus, if you've never said, Jesus, I want a relationship with you, please don't walk out of here tonight without without having done something about that. Now what Jess and the team are going to do is sing that beautiful song they sang earlier tonight. And while they're singing and while you're looking at those words, would you please consider seriously making sure that tonight, if you've never done so before, tonight is the night that you give your life to Jesus Christ. When they're finished singing, I'm still going to be here and I'm going to ask you what your answer is. Will you consider Jesus Christ? Will you? I'm going to ask that question and see what answer you're going to give when they're finished singing this song. Thank you, Jess. who is feeling distant from him. Now, I can't see anybody, so I don't know what's going on out there. But here's what I want you to do. If you have never said, Jesus Christ, I want to follow you, I want to become your follower, I want you to live in me, I want a relationship with you, but you want to do it tonight, please just quickly stand up out of your seat and come and stand at the front. There's nothing magical about the front, it just means we can find you. If that is you, would you do that? There's some other things we're going to do after this, but right now, if you've never invited Jesus into your life, now's the time to do it. 
could we have just enough house light for people to be able to see their way out? Somebody's going to pray with you. Somebody's going to explain some things to you. And if you say to yourself, I, I'm leaning into the idea, but I'm not ready yet, in your conference bag, you've got this response form. You can write some details on that and somebody can contact you at another stage, but why wait till then? Is there anybody, anybody here who doesn't know the Lord? And tonight's the night you're going to do something about that. I think I can see well enough to see that. Praise God. Maybe just a little more lights, thank you. Praise God. That's a very good decision. Somebody's just made an outstanding decision. Anyone else? there is and you're just not sure what to do about it you fill this form out but that's not where I wanted to leave everything I'm not done yet I've been a Christian since I was seven and I've been doing women's stuff for just about as long as I can remember and I know how easy it is for us to get snagged by perfectionism snagged by a sense of if I just do this I'll make it what I'm asking you to do tonight is if you know that you've drifted away from this absolute lostness in His worth, in His righteousness, and you have drifted into either just a boring faith, a faith where you feel it's just a constant signs that nothing's really alive. Would you stand to your feet? And this is what, so you'll know what, how this is going to be. I want you to stand to your feet. And I'm going to pray, and the Word is beautiful. I'm going to pray that over this conference, He will recalibrate your understanding about your worth. If you need that prayer, that's all we'll do. You can stand to your feet. God bless you. What you're doing is a very honest thing. God gets on that kind of honesty that kind of vulnerability, that kind of transparency. Waiting just a moment longer. I'm gonna pray for you. I'm praying for you as I would wanna pray for myself. Let my prayers be your words to the Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, you take our breath away with your extraordinary plan. You take our breath away with your love, your unrelenting love, your generous love that is forever towards us. Father, we thank you that when we consider you, we see something of ourselves and can barely believe it's possible. This suggestion that we can be women of worth because we allow your righteousness to inseminate our potential and thus create worth out of lives that we would otherwise easily dismiss as being a bit of a waste of space. Father, I pray for every woman who has found the courage to stand to her feet. I'm asking you in your kindness, in your magnificence, to work with her so that by the time she leaves here tomorrow afternoon, there will have been an internal shift, an irrevocable shift that she will never again rely on her own sense of value before she feels worth that on her very best of days she'll know that it's all you 
And on her very worst, she'll know she cannot live without you. We thank you that you are indeed a righteous God and that when you live within us, your love, your goodness, your seed does something to our insides that changes us, changes us forever from being spiritual strugglers to victors. Those of you who are standing, just keep breathing, keep your hearts towards the Lord. Don't let yourself start to second guess this. Don't let yourself go to old patterns of thinking where you take yourself out before he's had a chance to speak to you. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of these women who are standing when they lay their head on the pillow tonight, that something will be working through their being, that when they rise in the morning, there'll be a song that they haven't sung for a long time. There'll be a sense of lift and of life. Recalibrate. Some of you are going to want some prayer before you leave here. And Ali's going to come to the microphone now and she's going to guide you through that process. I just feel like God is eager to bless. He's never reluctant anyway. But the environment is here for something beautiful to happen in your life. Open your heart. Don't be in too big of a rush. It's nearly supper time, but you know what? If you need to, Ali's going to give you opportunities now to have a moment with God that perhaps you've needed for a long time. Thank you for your attention to the word. I eagerly look forward to being with you tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.